I'm Carolyn Metzler, and it is my joy and privilege to get to talk with you a bit about the vocation of prayer. Vocation because it belongs to each of us. It's in our baptismal covenant. Page 304. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and the prayers? If I were the composer of the prayer book, I might have said, in the vocation of praying, because it's not about saying prayers. It's about offering what we are, who we are. And so I want to start with a wee disclaimer that what I present to you today, I do not present as an ordained priest. I present it to you as a Christian, as somebody who has been at this for a long, long, long time. My dad tells me I started when I was about six years old. There was a tree outside our house in Indonesia that I would always climb every day before breakfast to pray, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because God is up there. Well, that's how long I've been at it since I was six. But I am not, even as a priest, a professional prayer because that belongs to each of us. In fact, if you invite me to your house and you say, Carolyn, would you offer grace? I would probably very respectfully say, no, thank you. That's your job. So what I offer you today is the stumbling stutterings of someone who has yearned to pray far better than I actually do. And we'll talk about that kind of vulnerability later on. It is my hope that you receive whatever you need to receive to help you get in touch with that part of your own soul that wants more than anything on the planet to be a good prayer. So I want to start with um, a distinction because I think sometimes prayer and meditation get confused. Meditation is not prayer. Meditation is, is a, a discipline of the mind um, that involves the breath and sometimes counting. But meditation is not relationship the way prayer is. Prayer is a conversation. It is an offering of dialogue, even if nothing comes back or nothing seems to come back. It is still showing up. So I have spent years and years and years and years and years and years showing up with little to nothing feeling like it came back. And yet, it doesn't matter that nothing comes back, that we don't get the great voice from a Love saying, oh, you are my beloved daughter with whom you are, I am well pleased. That would be wonderful. That would be awesome. <sighs> but it doesn't happen hardly ever, at least not to me. It does seem to happen for other people. Inviting someone to come to my home for dinner one day, and he said, well, I'll have to pray about it. I thought, how odd. How odd to have that kind of relationship with God that every detail of your life is a subject of prayer. But I'm presenting this as an offering of dialogue. <clears throat> it's only learned in relationship. Uh, and like everything else, it has to be embodied. So as we talk about prayer, we're not just talking about the mouth opening or the brain going silent but we have to include our bodies, our gestures, our, where are our hands? Um, how do we feel in our body when we pray? All this becomes grist for the mill. It is learned only in relationship. You can't learn it from a book, sorry about that. Many of us would rather read about prayer than actually pray. And we'll talk about that too. But it is the real you that is at prayer, not an idealized version of you. Thomas Merton said, 
Lord, let it be the real me that approaches the real you. And I think it was St. Francis who said in an all night prayer vigil, who are you, Lord? And who am I? Prayer brings those two things together. The real Holy One with the real you and the real me. Not, oh, <clears throat> I, I would like to be, look holy while I pray. No, let it be the real authentic you with your doubts, with your fears, with your mistakes, with your failures, with your hopes, all of it. So that's, that's the grist. We learn not only about God when we pray, but we also learn about ourselves. The most essential part of the spiritual journey is prayer. It's more important than anything, including sacraments. Um, it is our food. It is our oxygen. It is our water. Without prayer, we are nothing. We are nothing. We're just, we're just taking up space as, as Christians. So it, it is what I hope becomes a deep hunger for you, that, that you yearn for it always. I would share with you a poem uh, I wrote about six years ago called The Request. In a gladed wood dappled with light, a summer of my youth, in a moment of rare solitude, I sat upon a stone and asked for a gift as large as hope. Shyly, as one would address a hidden king, I folded my hands in meek humility, gazed skyward, and in my smallest voice, I dared to speak. Please, I begged, if it is allowed, let me have a vision, and closed my mouth to wait. The breeze stirred. I looked for rustling wings. The light glittered on new leaves. I sought halos. Nearby, a bird twittered, an insect hummed, and then another. But no heavenly choir burst into Gloria in excelsis. I listened intently. I peered urgently into the shadows, eagerly wanting to believe that any sign of life was my requested vision. But a truthful child, at last I rose, stretched cramped limbs, sad that my request had been denied. What only now I begin to know is that something was given me in that hour. A hunger, a yearning deep as a wound for the inbreaking of the holy in a way even I could touch. That simple request set me upon a path from which I have never strayed, a seeking I have never abandoned. Now, near half a century later, I see that what was granted to me was not a vision to explain and defend all my life, but vision itself, a way of seeing apart from vision, a call heard not through the ears, but in the bowels. Oh, child of wood and dappled light, I, your older self, now bless you for your courage to ask what could not be given. Trust your seeking, I whisper in your straining ear. Trust the yearning, it shows the way. Trust the hunger, it is a gift. Thus, I kissed you and sent you on your way. The prayer is not about getting something back. It's about giving ourselves as we are. 
It's not about changing God, especially not about changing God's mind. Why should we try to convince the God of love to do something kind for somebody? God is already there. But it's about opening our own awareness for how we can love better. That's, that's the business of prayer. Joan Chittister says, we do not need to practice prayer. We need to become prayer. And our image of God, the way you relate to God, will shape and determine the way you pray. Therefore, we need to have healthy images. If you have a God who's doing this all the time, you're going to pray very differently than the God who looks like the father and the prodigal son. If you have a God who needs to be entertained, if you have a God who needs you to be sitting right with your, your fingers in exactly the right position or, or what, you know, it's going to change how you pray. And so I would ask you to reflect on what are your images of God? My husband has two cats. They're his cats, mind you. The dogs are mine. The cats are his. But the cats always jump into my lap, assuming a welcome. Of course you want me in your lap. Yes, I know you're on your computer. But put that aside. Of course you want me on your lap. And I began to think some time ago, what if we approach prayer like that? What if we were the cat jumping into God's lap saying, of course you want me here? Instead of thinking, oh, God's too busy for me today. I mean, he's got the Middle East, he's got global warming, he's, you know, he's got racism, he's got all of these terrible problems. But what if God, I came to prayer assuming that God wanted the whole of me there? One more thing on this. This is just by way of introduction. Um, it might be helpful, along with your images of God, to give God a nickname. You know, Lord, God, I mean, all of our traditional words for the holy can be problematic in one way or another, depending on your politics and your theology and so forth. What if you came up with your own personal nickname for God, by which God is always accessible to you? You know, my, my personal nickname for God is Oholiamba. Oh, holy amba. I love to say it, first of all, which means I say it, get to say it a lot. But, you know, God is not my buddy, my pal. Um, God is also Lord. And I, for me, the word Lord doesn't mean God is a boy. It has to do with this utterness. So that's why the oh, holy part. And growing up, I had a Chinese ama take care of me. And Jesus talked about Abba. So Amba is the bringing together of, of the two genders of, of caring. So put that together, oh, holy Amba. That's my nickname for God. What's yours? What's yours? How can you use a nickname in your prayer to help you understand that you are talking with someone who is above all else, love. All right, how do we approach prayer? Well, there's lots of ways of approaching prayer, but I would suggest there's two main ways. The first is with fear and trembling. We yearn for it, but we avoid it. We want it to be our discipline, but we'd rather play spider solitaire. We, we, you know, in in the the Hebrew Bible, it was understood that one never look. You cannot look upon the face of God and live. So this is that transcendent aspect of God, which is so other, so beyond anything we can imagine. So, so remote but intimate at at the same time 
Um, there is a great story about a Hindu ascetic who was had the reputation of being a master prayer, living by the side of a river. And the disciple decided to come. And so he came and there was the master sitting by the river. And he was in his prayer. And so the disciple sat down and waited, 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 waited. Finally got tired of waiting. So he, <clears throat> nothing, he got a little closer. <clears throat> master, uh, master, nothing. He tapped him on the shoulder. Nothing. He shook him by the shoulder. Nothing. He friend said, Master, I've come a long way to learn how to pray. Aren't you going to pay me any attention? Suddenly, the master leaped up, grabbed the disciple around the waist, hauled him into the river, shoved him under the water, and held him there, kicking and sputtering and everything. And just when he thought he was going to lose consciousness, the master lifted him out of the water again. The disciple said, What'd you do that for? And the master said, when you want to pray as badly as you wanted to breathe, then you will begin to pray. I love that story. When you want to pray as badly as you wanted to breathe. So prayer is something that we come to, you know, this is not something to be treated frivolously. This is something serious. Okay, so the first thing is to, to come with fear and trembling. And the second way is to come with trust and love. That if one cannot look upon the face of God and live, God gave us a face we can know, which is the face of Christ. And so when we come to pray, we come to prayer as we are always in the presence of Christ. We're not off on a desert island doing this by ourselves. We are always, always in the presence of Christ, the face of God that we can know and look upon and love. The second thing is that we come in a pos position of undefendedness. You've all seen the priest at the altar with his or her, I can't do this on Zoom, hands up in the air like that. This is the Oran's position. It is, I would hold, not just the position of the priest at the altar, but of every prayer. And it is code for, look ma, no weapons. No weapons. I am open and undefended. I am undefended. And so, that it is that undefended place where we come to prayer without excuses, just exactly as we are. The goal of prayer is not information that we, we tell God what we think God ought to know, which is pretty ridiculous, or we wait for God to tell us what we need to know, which is less ridiculous. But the goal of prayer is intimacy. It's that relationship that I was talking about before. We come as the creatures approaching our creator in trust and in love that the creator who made us knows us so completely and welcomes us every single time we come. Now that love and relationship with the holy, just like any relationship in your lives, needs to be nurtured needs to be nurtured. You don't show up every six months and expect there to be an easy intimacy. It needs to be practiced. So even though we come as incomplete and um, sinful and all of that, yes, we come unworthy, but it is in our unworthiness that we are made worthy. You know, the a very gregarious priest I saw one time giving out communion and uh, a man at the altar had his arms crossed. He says, oh, I am not worthy, I am not worthy, I am not worthy. And the priest says, none of us is worthy, take it. Okay, that's how we come to prayer too. None of us is worthy, pray, pray, pray. 
So when we are open to God in spite of all that would separate us, there is no distance. There is no distance. God is not out there. If you get nothing else from this presentation, understand God is not out there. God is within. God is already within, abiding within you in love. And so, of course, you know, as a little kid said to me one day, so why do we have to pray if God's already inside? Well, we pray more for our benefit than for God's benefit. Yes, God knows it all knows it all and still needs us to know and so that's why we we speak the words we speak the words john chapman is a wonderful author who says pray as you can not as you can't so again you don't hold up this idealized version of yourself as a prayer prayer also connects us to all creation so it bears responsibility when you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Who do you think is going to do the doing? You are. I am. And so when we pray about situations for which we have concern, for which we have love, for which our hearts are broken open, know that you were, we're committed to in some way participate in the healing of that thing in the healing of the world in the in the nurturing of the person for whom we pray so prayer does bring responsibility you don't just pray get off your mat and say okay i'm done because it it calls us to be engaged in some way um you know i used to work for the center for action and contemplation they go together it's not one or the other. It has to be both. So we need to be willing to be changed so that we can do that. We need to be willing to be used as the prayer unfolds. To be a prayer is to be a lover. And sometimes, as we all know, loving involves pain. I want to move now into different kinds of prayer, but let's pause and join me in, in a chant, if you would. You might already know it, because this too is prayer. Take, oh, take me as I am, summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me.